Hey, uh, good morning, guys. Well, I guess it's afternoon for a lot of you other people in the world. I'm here with Marty Jamison. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about San Remo, uh, Milan San Remo today. Uh, Marty uh, has actually ridden uh, Milan San Remo twice, uh, both in 97 and 99. Marty, uh, wh what was your impression of the race today? Um, I was thoroughly excited and I had, I did not accept, ex, uh, expect the finale that we saw. So, um, yeah, that was amazing. Really amazing. Now, uh, Marty, you rode in Europe for 10 years. Uh, you started, uh, you graduated from the university of Utah. Uh, you moved to France. You lived in, did you live in Chateaubriand? Yeah. So uh, Chateaubriand, yes, I did. And that was actually the second year that I was there. Uh, my first year was down in the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, close to Po. Oh, nice. Nice. And so you rode uh, uh, 10 seasons in uh, Europe? Yep, I did. Yes. Yeah. And uh, started off your, you started off as, as an amateur, uh, then moved to WordPerfect for your first team? Yep, exactly. So yeah, three different, se three seasons as an amateur racing in France uh, for two different teams. And then, um, and then quickly, I you know I won the U.S. National Championships. My final year as an amateur in France, I won 11 races. I was top 10, 52 times around the world. And then uh, that, in conjunction with the U.S. National Championship, and then a lot of hard work, I landed my first pro contract with Word Perfect. I was working with Jan Jan Ross. Ah, it was he. I, you know, I love the guy, and it was it was fantastic. Um, that team was honestly, you know, anything that happened after in my career did not come close to what that experience was like in terms of the professionalism, the depth of knowledge, the respect that the, the team and management gave the riders. And that was definitely, you know, maybe a loving situation, although loving may not be the word because it's such a brutal environment, but we were supported so well. Nice. Nice. And then U.S. Postal, of course, after that. And yeah. <laughs> your highlights were winning the U.S. U.S. Pro National Championship. Uh, uh, yeah, bittersweet. But yeah, definitely uh, that's a jersey that they can't take away from me. So, um, you know, I, yeah. So I, always, I want uh, it there. I, I always appreciate when uh, the U.S. Pro champion, ch champion is riding in Europe and flying the colors. And of course, you did that very well in uh, 2000. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I think I wanted to rep. I think I had some really good rides with that jersey on my back. Nice. And then uh, Tour of Flanders and and um, Perry Roubaix. Yep, M multiple times. <laughs> so, so tell me. Yeah, uh, I think I maybe I said this. I can't remember. Uh, you rode the uh, Milan San Remo uh, both in '97 and '99. Um, yep, it sounds like you did your research. I wouldn't have guessed the exact years, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pro cycling stats has it. So um, shout out to them. And pro cyclists, we're like you know we're, we're in that tunnel and we don't always remember everything we did. You're following the wheel in front of you, suffering a lot. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what was your impression of riding on the Italian Riviera in that in that classic? Well, it takes a long time to get there, right? I mean, I think we're racing five plus hours before we get to the coast. In fact, it's yeah, probably over five hours before you get to the coast. And then along the coast, what, the last hour or so. Um, what's the impression? Um, the speeds, I mean, it, you know, it's fast all day long. And then definitely along the coast, you know, the nerves of the riders definitely becomes evident. The pace goes up a little bit. Um, not that we weren't going fast before. But I think I think the answer is your wattage goes up a little bit. There's nervous energy in the peloton. You've got the little bit of rollers. Um, um, so race is starting to really happen. So tell me, uh, what do you think of uh, the winner, um, Mahorich? Did you see? Uh, I don't know if you heard it, but I guess he had a special seat post that he was able to drop during the race. Yeah, you know, I I didn't know what he did, but he he was. I, I didn't know what they did to the bike, but he's. But I did hear his post uh, race interview. They said he he had set up the bike over the winter. He felt like it gave him a lot more control on the descent. Um, I don't buy it. 
<laughs> I don't buy it. You know what? He tweaked. What do you know the specifics of the seat post? I mean, come on. He tweaked his position, and he's trying to say that helped him on his descending skills. The, yeah. I, I want. I want to throw it back on him. The guy's yeah. a phenomenal descender. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not. I think the the comments about the equipment are are questionable. He's what he did as a human being in the descending was amazing. Yeah, he was the junior world champion at one point, so he's definitely a talented rider. And of course, had two nice stage wins at the tour last year. So, it's yeah, and I cool. think and I think twice national champion in his country of Slovenia. He was a he was wearing the jersey at the tour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a, an accomplished rider already for the media. Yeah, right. No right. question. I don't. You know, I mean, he, whatever they did to that bike. He's under contract, and and maybe they have a little. I mean, what's the seat post? Is the change in geometry, position, and you can do that with your. You can adjust any seat post to get what you want. I don't know what they did that was special, but he definitely talked it up in his interview, and right. um, I think that's you know we need to sell humble. bikes, but well, <laughs> but you know what? It's his talent. His talent was what he did on that descent. With did you see him go off the road? I, when he made the attack, I tried to look at that, and I was putting together a photo gallery at that particular point. So okay, I kind so of missed it. Right when he made the when he made the move, when he just went off the front of the group, he went on the left inside corner, and he went off the lip of black asphalt into the gutter, which is concrete. Yeah. And when he he kind of did a little bit of a, a little bit of a hop, not 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 a real erratic hop, but he lifted the weight off the bike to clear that one or two inches of black asphalt that rolls over onto the concrete. And, and he had he had a little bit of a wobble when he went in that gutter, but he popped right out of it at full speed. So I'd, I'd like to go back and see a replay of that because it was, it, it, it could have ended his race, yeah. but he pulled it off. He pulled it off quite well. Again, what we were talking about, a very talented bike rider. I wonder if he does his cross and, and uh, I'm, I'm asking, I don't know. If he does cross and mountain biking in the off season, um, I would guess. I would venture to say yes. I don't yeah. know. I don't know him, um, but you know, I think you know. I think the the viewing public. I know my my experience. Um, when people saw me race a mountain bike, they just they couldn't believe it. They're calling you a roadie. They're dumbfounded. But you know, I I did. I've done a lot of mountain biking. So yeah. Um, you know, we're not pigeon, we're not always pigeonholed the way, you know, the way you see on the screen. Right. Uh, today, Pogachar, I was, I have trouble pronouncing his name. I won't uh, even try. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to do any better. <laughs> uh, three attacks on the Poggio. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, we, you and I were talking before the show. You didn't, you uh, were questioning his commitment to the attacks. Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, three times, all three times, really, he looked back almost too long. I, I, I really think he was he was flexing without commitment. Um, you know, a, a true champion who's going to win uh, Milan San Remo in a fashion that would, which would have been required him to make a serious attack to get away ahead of any of the sprinters or like today's downhill specialists. Um, you, you don't look back, and I think the, the attack would have needed to be a little more um, commitment, meaning ferocious. I mean, he would have he would have needed a little more of a gap. I didn't see that. I think it was a little more posturing and flexing. I didn't um, I didn't like seeing that from a grand champion, to tell you the truth. And and uh, Yumbo Visma seemed to be able to shut him down on on most of them. There was a couple of times when uh, Van Aert was gapped a little bit, and I. I think at one point Roglic was quite a ways back. Uh, he might have been showing some fatigue from his racing earlier in the week. Yeah, but Roglic, he made he also made an attack on the Poggio. He yeah. did one little move, kind of behind his teammate, and then he did make a move. Yeah, and right after they, after they caught Pogachar. Yes, he did that little counter attack, and yeah, it's, that was that was so he did one, and that that that, that looked kind of serious. I think. You know, he was testing his legs to see if he had it, you know, had enough to get away. But, you know, I think, you know, that race come. it's just, you know, the riders know the history as well. And maybe they have some fatigue from what they've been doing in the last few weeks. 
Um, but that race often comes down to a sprint, you know, like, and even, even historically or what I remember, and I don't watch every year, um, but um, more riders arriving to the sprint finish. So, um, you know, just going back to what we saw today, I thought it was, it was a, you know, smaller groups, yeah, smaller group, um, broken up and really was just wonderful racing today. Yeah. A lot of the sprinters, boy, a lot of them got spit out pretty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and what happened to Sagan? There was something in his derailleur. So yeah, he had it, it, yeah. It looked like the, something was dangling off the, the bottom. I didn't. Yeah. Some it. kind of like twig or string or something that his, his derailleur picked up and he had a bike change. And I think that was hard for him to come back. And I don't know. Yeah. Don't know well, it was right before the Chapressa, wasn't it? And so. Yeah, and, and I and I did see him on the Poggio. I think I think I saw him in the back of the camera, so he was close to the front. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing now, uh, Jameson Cycle, uh, Jameson Cycling Tours. Yep. So I retired after the after the year 2000, um, stateside for like two years, and then uh, I you know I missed the sport. I missed cycling. I went back. I went back and started a company doing bike tours in Europe very small boutique high-end bike tour company i've been doing that for now what nine i think it's 19 18 of 19 years uh, we missed a year because of covid um, i did go back last year um less business just simply because it's uh post-covid not a lot of people traveling and frankly this year is looking similar um omicron invasion um, just not as much, but I do have a, I, I'm going back for a handful. What I have now are mostly repeat customers that have been coming back multiple years in Europe. So small groups, um, bike tours in Europe, all throughout Western Europe. And, uh, I'll, I'll include a link in the, uh, description of this. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing this year? So I'm doing a Provence trip. Um, uh, my trans Pyrenees trip is quite um, popular i get strong riders on that i will be doing one trip to the tour de france in the pyrenees and then i have a couple of private groups uh, between the dorgone 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 region and bordeaux and then uh the pyrenees up and over into the basque country they have races going through with a lot of those areas it's pretty fascinating oh they have races everywhere <laughs> yeah i mean it, yes at least in the years i raced it was insanity how many races were available yeah yeah i at one point i got uh, the belgian cycling federation faxed me back when people were faxing uh, a list of all the races in belgium yep and yep. you know on any given day there were four races at a time <laughs> that's exactly right and you know back when i was racing in france as an amateur we would get this booklet that looked like a small the small telephone book and you would flip through that and the print was really small, like a, like a, like an old telephone book. And you could, it was just like page to page of like or a full page or a second page of all the races available in France only of every race on that day. And in, in within like 60 miles or a hundred miles of where I was living, let's say in Chateaubriand, I could pick three to four races on any given day, every single day of the week. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And then it was so much fun because you could look at those races and really you would scrutinize the prize list and the prize list would be indicative to who would be showing up. So if you were not, you know, if you were just kind of tired, but you need to still be racing, you might pick a day that had a prize list 20 deep or 25 deep, but, it, and, and then look at the, the amount of money, what 20th place was worth um conversely if you looked at a race that was top 10 heavily weighted in the amount of money you know you might not go there because you're not going to make any money or i mean you just did these strange things to like decide which race to go to nice nice yeah well very cool thanks for joining us this is our first podcast anything else you want to say uh we'll, we'll certainly do our best to help you promote your uh, cycling tours. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I, I haven't, you know, it's, I haven't been, I haven't watched and really watched lots of, uh, bike racing since my career. Um, I've been, obviously I've been at the Tour de France almost every year since I retired. So I'm seeing footage on the television when I'm there, although I'm working a lot, 
but you know, you know, I was, I knew we were going to do this, um, this, this meeting and podcast right now. So I watched, you know, over two hours of the race and um, it got my juices flowing. And one, one final comment is like the sound of the helicopters overhead, which I could hear in my video feed. Um, that is dear to my heart because anytime as a rider that you really heard for long periods of time, the helicopters over your head, it, it meant that you were doing something right. It meant you were in the break or at the front of the peloton when it was kind of critical moments. So the 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 uh, the breakaway would always have a helicopter above their heads if it's if it's a large race, if it's a big race. Right. So anyway, listening to the helicopters is uh, that's that that means something to a pro rider. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun. Well, good. Uh, thank you for joining us and. Uh... We'll post this online soon. Very cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. Yeah. Bye.